welcome back students so professor dhanshu sekhar singh has discussed many of the strengthening mechanisms now today uh, i will be discussing about yet another strengthening mechanism which is again possible because of interaction of dislocations this time it is interaction of dislocation with dislocations so the mechanism that leads to this uh, that comes out of this is called strain hardening and it is one of the primary methods by way because of uh, which is employed on metals and alloys to improve their strength so for example you may have heard that rolled steels so why are the steels rolled because it induces a strain in the material and these strain causes dislocations generate dislocation generation and then the dislocations interact with each other and because of that the strength increases so what happens in between that is what we will understand over here so to begin with we will look at single crystal deformation so how does a single crystal deformation look like now you remember that we had uh, a single crystal and where we looked at the critical resolve shear stress so once you are pulling it then the once the critical resolve shear stress for the plane one of the plane reaches then dislocation starts to move in that particular plane but then eventually other there are other dislocation slip planes over there and eventually when you keep increasing the load then the stress for other uh, the stress would reach the critical resolve shear stress for other slip systems and therefore they will also also start to come into picture so that is uh, why you will always have multiple slip system in a material even though for a single crystal system as you would see it to begin with we will always have one particular slip system and then eventually it, others uh, kick in so we know that in a material there will be multiple slip system even in a single crystal so i mean any material system it is dependent on material system not on the whether it is single crystalline or polycrystalline so they will always have multi, uh, multiple slip system now as you increase the tensile load so for the sake of completion let me just uh, redraw what we had used earlier which was so this is let's say this is a single crystal and there is one slip system which is like this which would be the first one to so we know let's say we know beforehand that this would be the first one to reach the critical resolve shear stress so there will be several of these in parallel and you are applying the load like this because of this the crystal would so i am drawing in a little exaggeration but this is what happens so there is kind of a rotation because there are parallel slip systems and the slip is taking place on all of these individually and because you are applying a load so this will kind of bend and it will also cause other slip systems to get activated so first thing is as the tensile load is increased resolved shear stress on one plane is reached one plane or system i should say uh 
सॉरी इट रीचेस क्रिटिकल वैल्यू so this one will start to the differ this locations would start to move on this and this would be the primary slip plane now as you keep increasing the stress what would eventually happen is that one because of the rotation and also because you're increasing the load other slip systems would also reach the critical value so critical result shear stress or other systems is also reached so let's say those systems were somewhere like this maybe third one was little more oriented away so it is the closer it is to 45 degrees uh, as you would be able to see uh, from the equation they will be the first ones to first one to get activated and then other ones which are further away from 45 degrees they will get activated and so the slips is so, so the dislocations in other other planes also start to move and you can realize that when one if only one pair or one set of planes were activated and dislocations were moving only on them then all the dislocations were moving parallel to each other they were just moving out and they were escaping from here which actually led to this rotation however once you have other planes then dislocations would start to intersect and interact with each other and that would lead to lot more complex phenomena and overall if you look at the resolved shear stress versus resolved shear strain plot for a single crystal this is how it would look like so now let me draw so this is the x and y axis and now i will on the x axis you have comma and on the x y axis you have resolved shear stress tau the plot would look looks like something like this and we will explain the various features of this so overall what you would see is that there are three different zones and these would be represented as a stage or phase 1 stage 1 and somewhere over here if you remove the transition so this is second stage let me write the second stage this stage 1 and i have uh, left this region because this is more like a transition region and this is the third stage and you can actually see some distinct features in all these three stages so now let we will move on to discuss 
what are these distinct features that we see in each of these stages. So first thing is that three stages. And remember, this is single crystal. So in stage one, what we see is that as you increase the strain, the stress increases, but very soon it reaches a saturation value and remains constant after that, which is expected because what is happening here is that there is only one parallel set of planes where dislocations are moving and they are not uh, increased, the density is not increasing, they are, they, their number remains constant and they are just escaping from the surface. So there is no strain hardening taking place. So this is when slip system with lowest CRSS gets activated. And what we observe is that uh, there is saturation, which is almost no strain hardening because all the dislocations are eventually escaping away. So here, basically only one set or one parallel set of this, uh, planes have got activated. Now in the second stage, what we will observe is that more than one slip system gets activated. which means that there are more and more dislocation interaction taking place. And you remember there are forces that we talked about when there are more dislocations. So there is force from one dislocation to another dislocation. And when there are more than, um, when there are several, so there are forces acting on each of them. And therefore, if you are applying a stress, for a dislocation to move, basically what, what you are trying is to overcome all these internal stresses. So a larger amount of internal, uh, larger stress is required to overcome these internal stresses. And hence we see a very sharp rise in shear stresses. Strain, almost linear strain hardening is observed. And the main mechanism of strengthening is pile up. which was discussed like uh, by Professor Sudhanshu Singh in, with respect to grain boundaries. But here also, once there is intersection of dislocations and then there are some uh, immobile regions and the dislocations cannot pass through that and therefore they kept piling up over there. And therefore there are several such, you can say knots or locks where the dislocations cannot pass through and they keep piling up over there. And which eventually means that a much higher stress is required for dislocations to keep moving.
and it is at this stage that dislocation tangles meaning now that you can see it they are intersecting like each other something like this and some of it will form a loop other will remain there and therefore the dislocations do not remain independent of each other they begin begin to get tangled with each other so that kind of tangling of uh, dislocation starts to take place which results also result in dislocation cell structure so at this stage you would also expect to see some amount of cell structure getting formed and these are very well documented if uh, people have done careful experiments with single crystal and they did find these different stages and whatever important key points that we are writing down here they have all been uh, observed in majority of the systems Then the third stage. So let's just uh, let's come back and take a look here. So this was stage one where almost no strain hardening is taking place. When we say strain hardening, meaning the stress required with increasing strain is not increasing. So stress is almost constant. While in second stage we see almost linearly increasing. And in the third stage, what we see is that the stress uh, strain hardening is decreasing. There is a decreasing tendency for a strain hardening. So in, initially, there is a large rise of dissolved shear stress with amount with small amount of strain increase, and uh, later on that rise becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So the strain hardening becomes strain hardening rate becomes lower, uh, becomes smaller and smaller with increasing strain. So one of the chief characteristics of this stage three is that it is characterized by decreasing rate of strain hardening. Now, this, uh, why is this decreasing rate of strain hardening taking place? So it is taking place because some amount of dynamical recovery is also taking place along with deformation, which, re which releases part of the strain. And uh, regarding dislocation, the cross slip starts to take place, which also releases some of the stress, which would have been caused because of the pileup. So the stresses are so high that uh, so cross slip requires a little higher stress because it is on a different plane which is not the lowest stress plane. So because of the increased stress, cross slip is now more convenient and therefore cross slip becomes more common. And when it takes place, then it releases the stress created because of pileup. Another point uh, that has been observed or another observed phenomena that has been observed is that behavior in this stage is temperature dependent. Meaning if you go to higher temperature, then strain hardening rate is lower. If you are at lower temperature, then strain hardening rate is higher. So this suggests that it is temperature dependent. And what phenomena, dislocation phenomena is temperature dependent? It is the climb. So it clearly indicates that climb is also active in this stage.
and we saw that in the previous stage dislocation tangles were beginning here it is confirmed that this dis dislocation tangle or entanglement becomes even more pronounced and intersection of dislocations is the chief strain hardening mechanism So this is how the dislocations qualitatively, this is how the dislocations uh, lead to strengthening in the single crystal. So you can clearly see that as the strain is increasing overall the strength, the result shear stress required for deformation is increasing, meaning the strength of the material is increasing. So that, that is for single crystal. Now also, let's also briefly take a look at how this thing will happen in a polycrystalline material. So we already know that if you were to look at the polycrystalline material, then over here, what we see is only the second and the third stage. So there is somewhat uh, second or linear point and then there is that ever decreasing strain hardening rate so in brief what we can say is that there is only stage two and stage three deformation taking place in polycrystalline materials So why is there no stage one over here? And it should not be surprising and it should not be very difficult to answer. It is because we will not have only one set of plane at any time. So only one set of planes cannot deform. Let's understand this, why it happens. So in a polycrystalline material, let's say I draw it schematically like this. So you have grains which are contiguous and the material is contiguous and there is one grain and very next to it there is another grain and so on. So therefore the material looks something like this. Now let's say if only one set of planes were deforming in two neighboring grains. So we'll pick two grains from here. Let's draw it separately. Let's say the two grains look like something like this. And this is the interface or the boundary, and this is the another, this is another grain. So let's say that one set of plane which can deform is such that. Deformation is taking place along these lines in this one and along these lines in this one. So now what will happen? If we allow this kind of uh, deformation, what will happen is that there will be steps getting formed over here. But 
these set of planes cannot fill this gap. Therefore, eventually what you will see is that And this one will have, this will remain plain because no deformation takes place over here. And what it eventually tells you is that there would be gaps created between the grains if only one set of planes were deforming in a polycrystalline materials. So clearly this is not possible. You need minimum some number of uh, planes uh, systems to be deforming simultaneously to be able to accommodate or to ensure that there is contiguity of material. Otherwise, the, there will be voids created at very small strains itself. Now, looking at this itself, you would be able to say that uh, there should be minimum of two independent slip system in a 2D, 2D material system. So if theoretically there were 2D material system, there must be at least two directions. So if there one set is like this, and if you had a corresponding set, another one like this, then it would have been able to take care of all the gaps at the interface and there would have been no problem of contiguity. Similarly, if you uh, people have shown that if you are, uh, since we are have materials in 3D, so in for 3D materials, you need minimum five independent slip systems. So overall, what we see is that in the, in, when you are deforming a polycrystalline material, it shows only uh, the stage two and three, and it is obvious that it cannot show stage one, which is dominated when you have only one set of planes deforming in the single crystal. So this polycrystal is similar to the single crystal with only stage two and stage three. Then we also looked at uh, why stage, stage one kind of scenario cannot exist because it will lead to uh, contiguity of materials. There will be gaps created. And since we know that it doesn't happen, there must be contiguity and therefore there must be at least two independent slip system in a 2D material system and at least five independent slip system in a 3D material system. So now that qualitatively explains the role of dislocation in the deformation of single crystal and polycrystalline material. Now let's uh, get a little bit of into quantitative values to understand how the dislocation uh, causes strength, uh, increase in the strength. So for that, now we will go back to our Inter, uh, equation for interaction of dislocations. And you would see that from there, we would be able to derive what is called as Taylor hardening. So if you remember, we had uh, dislocations, one like this, and let's say another one is somewhere on another plane. Okay, so we said that this is a distance y and some distance x, what are the forces acting on this? Now, from that forces, we will be able to understand how much force you would be able, to, you would need to apply externally. So whatever force is there, you would need to apply externally opposite of that to be able to overcome that forces if you want to move the dislocation in the other way or in the direction of the applied stress. So for this kind of scenario, we looked at and we saw that the stresses 
look like? And over here, we saw that this is equal, this is the distance in along x direction. So for the x distance, we know this is one y, somewhere over here, we have two y and so on. And here we have minus one y, minus two y and so on. Now, this is how the forces are acting on this, the other dislocation. Let's say this is a fixed dislocation for some reason, just for the purpose of understanding the amount of force required for movement of dislocation. So let's say this is the fixed dislocation and this is free to move. Then this is the force acting on it. Now, if we want to move this dislocation in some, or we want to stop this dislocation from movement, or we want to move it in any other direction, then clearly whatever force is acting on it, we must apply more than that. And if you want to be able to completely move it as per the applied stress or as per your desire to say, then you must apply the, a minimum of this much stress, either this much or this much in the other two directions. And just to make things clear that this value is actually, let me equal to this value in positive sense and this one is equal to negative sense. The earlier time, the last time I drew this, uh, if you go back, you would see that there is a little bit of discrepancy. This one is a lower than this, but that was a schematic and uh, and because I couldn't draw it as accurately as it is supposed to be. So just keep in mind that the value of this is force and this force is same in the positive direction and this force and this force is also same in magnitude, but just in opposite direction. And uh, this is your tau. This is the X. And where does this maxima or minima occur? And if you would be, if you look at the equation carefully, you would be able to find out that this minima or maxima occurs at 0.414 y or equal to minus 0.414 y. So if we look at the force equation that we looked at earlier, F, equal to tau into B is equal to G D X X square minus Y square times B by two pi one minus nu. Now, if I want a critical tau, which is this one, then I need to calculate it at x equal to 0.414y or the minus of this, minus 0.414y. And it is not very difficult to show that it will come out to gv by 2 pi 1 minus nu y and the rest of the factor would come out to approximately 1 by 4. So this is gb by 8 pi 1 minus nu y. And if we call this distance y as h, because y is uh, represents some many at places something different. So the tau critical can be written as gb by 8 pi 1 minus nu h. Now this, what is this stress signified? This stress signifies that you need to apply at least this much stress, shear stress, to move this dislocation in either direction. If you are able to apply this much shear stress, then this dislocation can be moved in any direction. 
a little bit of high, a little bit higher than this because this is the maximum stress uh, that is acting on it because of the presence of another dislocation. So if there is another dislocation and you still want to be able to move this dislocation, you need to apply at least this much of shear stress. So that is what this equation tells us. Now let's move on. We can have, this is just the, there we need not be just one dislocation in a material, there will be a lot more dislocation. So what do we do or how do we calculate that? Not very difficult. So let's say we have, so here we'll make some assumption that the dislocations are slightly arranged. So it is something like this. And let's say the distance from here to here is H. Similarly, the distance from here to here is H. So if I were to find the dislocation density, so let's say I take this area. So this is 2H by 2H or 2H square and number of dislocation that we have over here is one single dislocation and one by four into four. So there is total of two dislocation in this area of two H whole square. So if I were to calculate the dislocation density, rho dislocation, then it will come out to two by two H square, which is one over two H square. And now if I want, I can also write H in terms of the dislocation density. So it is like this. And now I can insert this H because this is H. I will not be able to calculate for individual dislocation, but yes, as a dislocation, uh, if we know in general, the dislocation density of the material at a given state, it can also be calculated by various means. So I would know rho. So I can use this to insert or approximately calculate the value of H. And therefore, tau C would become GB, which was, uh, sorry, which was already given as GB by 8 by 1 minus nu H. Now, instead of tau C, I will now call it tau naught, which is the stress it represents the stress required for the material to deform. So for a given dislocation density, what is the stress that is required to deform the material? And this would be given by GB by 8 pi 1 minus nu. And instead of H, I will write 1 by 2 root 2 1 by rho. And uh, this can be approximated as alpha GB root rho which is or the Taylor hardening relation. So let me just write down what it is saying. It is giving the shear strength of, um, of material as a function of dislocation density. And what it is saying is that as you keep increasing dislocation density, shear strength of the material keeps increasing. So this is exactly what we mean by strain hardening. When you have more the strain, more the dislocations, more is the strength of the material. And uh, if you look at a single crystal, uh, sorry, polycrystalline material, so we know the stress strain diagram looks like this. So if you compare the original yield strength versus this point, 
and let's say you deform it up to this point and then release the stress. Then it will come back. And once you, if you do the tensile test again, this will become the new yield strength of the material. So why has the yield strength increased? Because as the strain increases, dislocation density increased. So the strain is increasing, which leads to dislocation density increment, and therefore strength, the yield strength of the material increased. And people have also plotted a normalized shear strength of the material against the dislocation density. And what they observed is something like this. So if you look at y-axis B root row, so this is the dislocation density and the normalized shear strength of the material, people have obtained a straight line relation. So it clearly confirms the Taylor hardening relation. So this is, this clearly establishes the strain hardening. Now we will go through some example to be able to appreciate this even better. So here, the first example is that you are given that two positive dislocations are located in two parallel glide planes, which are 10 nanometer apart. At what value of separation in X direction, so in this direction, they experience maximum and minimum force. So there is force between the two, the dislocations are, there will be some interaction and because of that, they will either attract or dis, uh, dis repel each other. So the question is at what uh, value of X, they will experience maximum and minimum force. And if you go back to the notes, you would see that the maximum force occurs at x equal to 0.414 y. But y is 10 nanometer, which means 4.14 nanometer. And minimum occurs at x equal to minus 0.414 y, which is minus 0.414 nanometer. So maximum and minimum are here just uh, the signs. Uh, well, that they are positive or negative, but magnitude wise, the forces would remain same. And in fact, both of them would happen to be attracting. So both of them will try to attract it and eventually form a array like this. This is what we saw when we looked at the interaction of dislocations with similar sign when they are in different planes. So this is example one. Now let's look at Still another example. So here you are given that in a material, 100 dislocations were observed in TM in an area of 10,000 B square. So what is the shear stress required to move dislocation through this material? So TM is basically assuming that it is showing the representative dislocation density. So let's look at what would be the representative dislocation density value. It is equal to number of dislocation, which is 100 by 10,000 B square, which is equal to 1 over 100 B. Now, let's look at the relation for shear strength. We know it is equal to GB by 8 pi 1 minus nu root 2 into root instead of root row we can write it as implies root row is equal to one over root and under root 100 is 10 and sorry this is uh, again b square so under root b square becomes b so 2 into 1 over 10 b and therefore uh, the B gets cancelled over here and what we remain 8 into 10 becomes 80. So this becomes G root 2 by 80 pi 
1 minus mu. So this gives you the shear stress required to move dislocation. And if you had higher dislocation density, you would see that the shear stress required is also higher. So this clearly establishes strain hardening. So over here, we have show assumed that strain, increasing strain causes increase in dislocation density. And that part is still to be shown or understood. And that we will uh, look at in the next lecture. But assuming that increasing the strain increases the dislocation density, we have clearly seen qualitatively and quantitatively, quantitatively that the strength of the material should increase. So with that, we will come to end of this lecture. And next time we will look at how movement of dislocation with the strain causes increase in the dislocation density. Thank you.